Hello and welcome to Veterans of the Valley. I'm Tom Turbyville. B.J. Bill Kling started Kling Engineering in 1975, but by then his own surveying skills had been tapped in most every arena you can imagine, including in World War II as an infantry soldier with the 102nd. His unit sailed overseas late in the European campaign in 1944, but in time for the Battle of the Bulge and in time to witness the surrender of thousands of German troops, many soldiers who were interrogated by Bill Kling. After the war, Bill Kling entered Texas A&M as a 30-year-old freshman. After the war, he met Flores, and they've been married 57 years now. B.J. Bill Kling is our guest today on Veterans of the Valley. It's a pleasure to have you, Bill, on Thank Veterans you. of the Valley. I'm going to let you sort of take me from 1941 up to 1944 when you first went overseas from uh, New York straight over to France and sort of how you got into the service. The draft came up and your number came up in 1941. Is that how it worked? That's right. It was um, October of 41. My draft number came up and I had an opportunity to be I deferred because I was doing some work for uh, Matagorda County, mm -hmm. living in Bay City. I chose to uh, go ahead and enter the service and serve my year's time and and come back and get about my my life. But uh, Pearl Harbor came along about that time, uh, in December of that same year, so uh, it was uh, almost five years later before I got to take up my civilian life again. Yeah, a lot of young men and, and women who had planned on just serving a year, Pearl Harbor came, and that, that changed things for a lot of people, didn't it? That's right. We were in for duration then. Indeed. Uh, I went from Bay City to uh, San Antonio, Fort Sam Houston. Yes, sir. Stayed there and was processed through the, uh, uh, in, into the military and given uniforms and filled out the necessary papers. This was October in Texas, and what kind of uniform did they give you? All wool. <laughs> All wool. It seemed like it was thick as a blanket, and the temperature was in the high 90s or low hundreds, I thought. The Army thought it was October, so it must be cold everywhere. That's right. <laughs> so they sent me to, uh, assigned me to the field artillery, and I went, was assigned to an instrument and survey school in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Went to Fort Sill, completed that training. My mother and dad came up that Christmas. Uh, they had to uh, borrow uh, gasoline ration stamps to have enough gasoline to drive from Bay City up to Lawton, Oklahoma and Fort Sill. But anyway, we had a visit. After I completed my uh, training in the instrument and survey school there, I was assigned to the 45th Division, which was just been occupied activating at Fort Sill. We were issued a equipment there. Uh, some of it was which was uh, condemned tents, mm -hmm. worn out. You could go to sleep at night and look up through the holes in the tents and <laughs> see the stars and hope it didn't rain, which it did sometime. Right. Uh, after, after a few weeks there, we were assigned to Camp Barkley out close yep. to Abilene, right. um, went out to Camp Barkley, moved into a cotton patch in which the, the uh, cotton had been gathered, but the stalks were still still standing up <laughs> two, three feet high. And you were in eight-man tents, right? In eight-man tents with, uh, with wood-burning stove in there to uh, keep you warm. We built uh, wooden walkways to stay out of the mud. During this time, the, the barracks were being constructed uh, for the, on the base there, and we later moved into, uh, into barracks. Stayed there for a few months, and then was assigned to uh, Fort Devens, Massachusetts. Went up on a troop train, took all of our equipment uh, on the train. Uh, after we got up there and got settled in with our equipment, they moved us down to uh, East Falmouth, Massachusetts, which was on Narragansett Bay. Mm -hmm. And our mission there and what we did for the next several months was to de establish the routine that was used for landing craft throughout the uh, uh, Pacific and 
European theaters. For the beach landings, like, That's right. like at Normandy or at Iwo Jima. Right. Now, the, basically the way this worked, uh, they were landing, you, the troops came in on troop ships, mm -hmm. offloaded out in, the, out in the ocean or bay, wherever, offshore, hopefully out, outside of uh, enemy artillery fire, mm -hmm. loaded on, uh, on landing craft, and they went in what they call waves. And the first wave had certain personnel that were key in getting the uh, uh, beachhead established. Uh, and when we first started out, well, I had about 60 pounds of, of uh, equipment and could barely move. And we got through, I had a, a compass and a set of field glasses and my personal weapons, and that was, that was it. So, mm -hmm. But anyway, these tactics were used successfully uh, most of the time throughout the, uh, the rest of the war. After, after this, we were uh, moved to Pine Camp, New York, up in the upper state New York, uh, just across the uh, St. Lawrence River from uh, Canada. Right. It was wintertime, and we were maneuvering against the Second Armored Division. Uh, snow was about two feet deep, and it was cold. Being, a, being from Texas, I was ready to get out of there, so there was an opportunity to apply for officer's training school. So I applied for, <clears throat> for officer's training and was accepted and sent back to Fort Sill for officer candidate training. Right. And uh, in December of that year, I was uh, graduated as a second lieutenant. And then uh, in, the, in January, assigned to uh, the 102nd Division, which was being formed at, at uh, Camp Maxey. In Paris, Texas. In Paris, Texas. And I understand there were some uh, young soldiers that came from all parts of the country, New York, Illinois, that just weren't, weren't used to that, right? Well, most of them uh, uh, didn't, uh, well, they'd spent their life on concrete pavement and they didn't <laughs> know about post oak trees and grass burrs and, and uh, <laughs> Uh, we we'd go out in the field and it was a it was a real learning experience for them. <laughs> for a lot of people, especially the non-Texans. Uh, one of the <laughs> things that may be kind of interesting, and uh, I was assigned to the to the 380th Battalion, uh -huh. which was one of the uh, three 105 Howitzer Battalions uh, in in the 102nd, and my my uh, battalion commander was. Uh, Colonel Hannigan. Colonel Hannigan was later picked by Earl Rudder for the A&M. He was then General Hannigan, mm -hmm. and he was dean of men here at A&M. Wow. And we re reacquainted ourselves after he came here, and uh, uh, so that that was. That's uh, that's uh, quite uh, adds to the the premise of it is a small world out there. That's right. Uh, eventually, you went to uh, Louisiana on maneuvers, and you told me uh, when we spoke yesterday that that you uh, you saw or you met General Patton. Yes. Well, yeah, we'll talk Pat about that. Well, Patton was there, and uh, if if fighting the war had been as physically trying as maneuvers in Louisiana, I don't know if we'd ever made it or not. But <laughs> I survived the. Uh, uh, the maneuvers in Louisiana, right. and uh, our unit was then assigned to uh, Camp Swift. Near Bastrop. Near Bastrop, right. between Bastrop and Austin. <clears throat> we completed or went ahead with our training and basically completed our training there. Mm -hmm. uh, while while uh, we were stationed at, at Camp Swift, I was uh, assigned to uh, or my, my survey department, at that time I was in Division Artillery Headquarters, uh, responsible for the training of all the surveyors in the Division Artillery mm -hmm. uh, of, of our uh, division. I was uh, assigned to then Camp Polk, mm -hmm. uh, not Camp Polk, Camp Hood, mm -hmm. uh, and did the basic surveying for the, what was then called the AGF test or Army Ground Force test. Yes, sir. All units had to go through a certain test at certain phases of their training 
to determine whether they were proficient at that level of their training. And uh, so I put in the basic control, uh, kind of an interesting story there. Uh, we wound up doing the job three times, uh, mainly because of the bad data that was given to us to start from. Yes, sir. We were living in tents out in the, in the middle of the impact area out there. Of course, they weren't firing at that time, but uh, it was hot and we were ready to get out of there. But anyway, that was uh, my first introduced introduction to the area up there around what's now Fort Hood. Right. Uh, I want to go ahead and get you overseas, so we'll fast forward. You went to, to New Jersey, to Fort Dix, yeah, and then yeah. in the fall of 44, you sailed uh, across to France, and I thought this was interesting. Whereas most veterans earlier in the, mor in the war, they took the North Atlantic route to, to England to prepare for their duty in Europe. But you were one of the first units to sail directly from New York straight to France. I believe that's correct. Right. I think we were the first division to sail directly from the States to the continent of Europe. So we landed at the port of, of uh, Cherbourg. Uh -huh in France and uh, uh, move from there where we we're living out in the field. My next task was with, uh, with our executive officer, Colonel Watkins, to run the Red Ball Express. Right. Now talk about this because uh, this, was a, this was a truck convoy. Yeah. The mm -hmm. Red Ball Express had 500 two and a half ton trucks and one ton trailers. Yes, sir. Their mission was to move all the supplies from the beachhead up into the combat area of where, it, where, where, where the soldiers needed. soldiers needed, and this was everything from food to ammunition to uh, uh, bed, shoes, what it, all supplies were moved on the Red Ball Express. I think a lot of people would be surprised to to, to understand that, that Normandy Beach, while it's most famous for D-Day and the D-Day landing and what happened there, that after that, long after that, it was actually used as a place to deposit these supplies, new supplies, and that's where you would go, Normandy, one place you would go with the Red Ball Express to pick up these, these supplies. And when we talk supplies, we're talking, I guess, uh, uh, weapons, jeeps, big supplies, little supplies, all kind of supplies to fight the war. That's right. Now, of course, what the Red Ball Express moved was, was the supplies, trucks you drive, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, supplies that were that you could load on a truck, right? Uh, right. Move, movable by truck, right? Uh, we, and uh, we we had a, a camp. We we used two one-way uh, roads through France. Mm -hmm. One going from the beachhead up to the combat area, and one returning. There was no civilian traffic or anything else allowed. Nothing but military and Red Ball Express. So you felt trucks. pretty you felt pretty secure. As far we as did, the, but the road. we still uh, we had we patrolled it all right. the time with uh, with mainly MPs that uh, that controlled it, right. uh, patrolled the area. Right. There was some some looting that went on, and uh, uh, we tried. We never stopped a truck. Mm -hmm. If it if it stopped, it, it stopped because it was broken down, and we had uh, we had wreckers and service vehicles that would hook on to it, bring it to the shop, and it was repaired and put back in service. Right, right. I want to get to, to this, this point now because I certainly don't want to miss it. You were a surveyor. That's right. And when, when, when people go around town and they see survey crews out surveying, uh, whether it's a piece of property here in Bryan College Station, they think of surveyors as people that are establishing property lines and such. But you were, a surveyor also use those skills to actually fight the war, to shoot the guns, to shoot them accurately, to be efficient with our weaponry. Talk about that whole aspect of being a surveyor and how it served us in the war. Uh, as far as I can determine from what my experience overseas mm -hmm. and what I have read since, the, the United States field artillery, Army field artillery, was the most efficient of, of any unit compared to the to the British, the French, and the Russians, and, and the Germans. Mm -hmm. We were able to take artillery pieces and fire more, more guns on the same target uh, accurately than, than anyone else. And this was because the first thing that we did when the artillery bata uh, battery and battalion went into, uh, into position was to tie the four guns in a 
and a battery together. Mm -hmm. The next mission was to tie, tie the three batteries of the battalion together. Then the next mission was to tie the battalions all together and tie them into the, uh, and then when I say tie in, it's determine the, re the location of each gun with reference to every other gun. Right. So that when you fired one gun on a target, you could, you could with, with very little mathematics or effort, you could fire all of them on them. And uh, this is what allowed us to ma mass artillery fire. Right. There was another little uh, thing, I don't know, it, you wouldn't call it a trick particularly, mm -hmm. but it was something that uh, I realized early on that proved to be very effective. The first few rounds of artillery are always, if they're on target, they're the ones that do the most damage. After two or three rounds of hit, then the enemy that you're firing on has found him a hole if there's one there or moved or something. So the, our effort was always to be most effective on that first round. Mm -hmm. a, a 105 howitzer or any howitzer that is, that is able to be at the gun barrel, which is able to be raised above, 45 degrees, you can fire two rounds out of the same gun and have them hit the target at the same time. Mm -hmm. One of them is high angle fire, which as, as, you, as you elevate an artillery piece above 500, above 45 degrees, then the shell begins to come back toward you. So you determine, you, you shoot the first shell high angle and the second one low angle fire below 45 degrees and uh, with the firing tables and the information that's available, you can figure out the exact time where it's two shells from the same gun hit the target at the same time, and, and that, that's that's pretty. It was a technology bad. and an intelligence that, that that you learned well before the war that served Americans in the war. You, along with the other surveyors, I want to move on. You uh, in your uh, relationship with the the, the, the German enemy, I, you were saying that. Uh, a little bit later on, the Germans had been backed up to the to the Siegfried Line, but it was at that point, when going through Holland, that you actually encountered uh, some resistance, and in in the form of pillboxes that weren't your normal pillbox uh, encampments, not like you would see at Normandy or something like that, but were camouflaged more as houses. Talk about about yeah, that. Well, the, I I believe I'm correct when I say the Siegfried Line was built sort of as a as a counter to the uh, Maginot Line mm -hmm. in France. Of course, now we're we're in Holland here. Uh, our unit was at this time was stationed in uh, Herlin, Holland, right. which was a border crossing between uh, Germany and, and Holland, and living in uh, in Dutch bar Holland barracks there. But we. Uh, I lost my train of thought. What was I talking about? <laughs> we were talking about uh, the, the the pillboxes and. Oh the, yeah. And the, now right. the 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 first line of defense was all camouflaged in pillboxes. Yes. Many of them in uh, uh, as houses. Right. Uh, or, or buildings of some sort, uh, the walls of which were able to be folded down and and the guns already in place. Now the Siegfried line was probably would average 15, 20 miles deep. Mm -hmm. And the, the back, the most eastern part of the, of the line was a series of bunkers where they had supplies and communications already in place. And it was just a matter of moving in a group of troops and keeping them in reserve in these, uh, in these bunkers until they were needed for a counterattack. Right. Uh, the the basic tactics of of uh, combat is that once you are attacked and the enemy breaks through, if you're going to survive, you better counterattack somewhere and reestablish control of of an area in which you can work from. Right. I want to stop for a second because I want to show a couple of pictures that you uh, uh, 
supplied to us. And the first one, I think, is going to take us all the way back to your hometown of Kasi that I chose. Uh, this is a football team, I believe, if I've got the, the right order yet, that we're going to put on the screen. Uh, but, uh, there you are. This is, uh, this is where you grew up in Kasi, just down the road from uh, Bryan College Station. And this was the 1935 football team. And I believe you said that you were in the back row standing next to the coach. That's who is, right. Who's in, who's in the suit? You're to the you're to the left of the coach. See, I'm there. one, two, three. Four I'm from the left. Fourth from the left. Right. Yes. How'd that team do that year? I don't remember. <laughs> Probably not very well. Probably didn't win a championship, or you no, wouldn't have remembered. No. We, and we've got we another didn't. photograph of a young uh, soldier, Bill Kling, and uh, there you are. Quite a good-looking soldier, and that you were a, a second you. lieutenant in that picture, right? I That's see shortly the bar. after I was commissioned. Right after you were commissioned. See the bar on your shoulder. Yeah. There you go. That's great. Um, you told us right before we went on the air here, you talked about uh, some instances that you, uh, that you flew uh, during the war, and it had to do with uh, sort of a reconnaissance type of thing. Talk a little bit about what that was about. Uh, the way the equipment was set up at that time, Division Artillery Headquarters, of course, controlled. We used uh, light aircraft, Piper mm -hmm. Cub type aircraft, mm -hmm. to two-seated aircraft uh, for uh, artillery observation to adjust mm -hmm. artillery fire. Uh, basically, this was done by, by firing around as close to the target as you could, and then the, the observer would tell fire direction control how much left or right to move the next round and whether to move it up or, or down. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, I, I, I did some of this mainly as uh, I, I fired core counter-battery, which was the, the uh, using core artillery, and sometimes we had as many as 25 battalions of artillery available to, mm -hmm. to fire. Right. That's a lot of firepower. Indeed. And uh, uh, we, any time we, we observed the, the German artillery flying or got a, or firing or we got a report from another observer somewhere, uh, then, then we tried to neutralize that and most of the time we were pretty effective at it. We've got about four minutes left. I want you to talk about the interrogation of the Germans who surrendered. I thought that that was interesting. You told me about some of the questions that you would ask to sort of discover what their habits were to sort of discover how to best fight them. Talk about some of the questions that you ask in the interrogation. Well, one of, one of the common things that uh, we tried to interrupt was uh, the hot meal that a soldier got in the, in the wintertime in cold weather was is a real morale booster. Right. If he's eating cold meals in a foxhole all the time, uh, it, it's, it gets pretty dreary. So if he can meet even in small groups with some of his compadres right. uh, and have a hot meal, even if it's nothing but a hot cup of coffee, it's a tremendous morale booster. Yes, sir. We realized that early on <clears throat> and made an, uh, an effort to interrupt this. So one of the questions that we would typically ask was, uh, uh, do, you, do you have a hot meal every day and, and what time is it? Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't try to ask them the, the military capabilities of their unit because they were well versed in the Geneva Convention. And, right. uh, but, but you would ask what most people would consider um, irrelevant questions, which once you fit them together, form a pattern. Uh, of, and, and we... Uh, I think we were effective in doing this. And 102nd had an interesting patch that you supplied to us today. I'm yeah. holding it here, and I think yeah. we can get a shot of it. You called it, it was the it was the Ozark Division. Is That's that right? right? The outer yellow ring there is the O, the mm -hmm. Z in the middle with the arc underneath. It was a, a unit that was formed in World War One, put in reserve or, or uh, disbanded between World War One and reactivated in World War Two. 
Yeah. And this is a unit that I went over, overseas with. Right. We just have a few minutes left, so we have to fast forward. Uh, you did not have quite enough points to, to come home as early as some, and you stayed till December of 1945. It was quite a trip coming home in the ocean. You thought maybe things were going to end on your trip <laughs> home because of a storm that you, that you came through, right? <laughs> yes, we, uh, we left out of Marseille, France, sailed through the, through the uh, Straits of Gibraltar, and headed for... Uh, the Virginia coast. Not too far out, we ran into a storm. Right. This is in January, uh, December and January of uh, 45, 46. Uh, the weather got so bad that uh, sailors were not allowed, or none of us were allowed out on deck except in an emergency situation, and then that was with safety harness on. Uh, the lines that you could see outside the the ship, uh, the seawater would freeze to where they were four to six inches in diameter. Wow. The waves were 50, 60 feet high. You'd look out the porthole and you looked up to see the, the crest of the wave when the ship was down in the trough of the wave. Right. So they, uh, which I think wisely, uh, turned south and added about a week to our, our uh, time coming back. There were four of us that played bridge all mm -hmm. the time when there and for a long time and maybe somewhere around the house I've still got the score pad. We were <laughs> we were up to almost forty thousand points. <laughs> Thirty eight thousand some odd points. We kept a running total of Bill Kling, the time just goes too fast. Uh, you came home, you started Kling Engineering in nineteen seventy five and you and Flores were married fifty seven years ago and uh, Graduated from A&M in 1953 as a 34-year-old senior. That's and correct. And, and thank you very much for your service, and we appreciate you being a guest on Veterans of the Valley. It's been an honor to visit with you. I appreciate it, Tom. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. I learn new things with every veteran that I visit on Veterans of the Valley, and it's amazing to learn how the familiar work of today's surveyor helped us win the tactics battle in the European campaign, thanks to B.J. Bill Kling of College Station for his service in the war and his continued contributions as a valued citizen. Thanks to all veterans for their service, and thank you to our underwriter, First National Bank. And be sure to read about other stories of veterans in Brazos Valley Heroes each Sunday in the Eagle. For Bill Kling, I'm Tom Turbeville. We'll see you next time on Veterans of the Valley.